the non-refundable credits, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about capital gains, and then we'll work on a problem or two, okay? Non-refundable credits, um, a continuation of our Pac-Man credits. They only go as long as they eat up a tax bill, okay? We're gonna talk about retirement savings, child tax credit, residential energy credit, adoption credit, which you're gonna all wonder why you had kids and didn't just adopt because you get more money for, more bang for your buck when the kid's on the return is an adoption. So, <laughs> so it's a one-shot deal though, okay? Not unless you wanna keep adopting every year and just keep the family going. Um, credit for the elderly or disabled, and then the last two, as I saw Liz working on her studies today, I said don't do that, okay? Alternative motor vehicle credit and plug-in electric drive motor vehicle credit, okay? The fact that I just breathed those words means we just covered it, okay? We're done with it. That's it, okay? If anybody ever does one of these, please let me know, okay? Because... I'm in a group chat and they gotta let me out of there, okay. Um, the, um, those credits, I bet they're not on the 2016 return. I think there's something that's gonna go away. Uh, energy credit, same thing that we're gonna cover. It's amazing how it reincarnates itself every year. Um, it's, it's kind of dwindled to next to nothing. You know, we used to have that, uh, you know, you put a new energy efficient furnace and you got $1,500 tax credit. Well, now you're lucky if you can get $150 credit on it, so, all right? And then it's become a lifetime credit, which means, you know, if you use 150 this year, you only got 350 next year, and once 500's gone, you're done. As long as you don't even get it if the credit stayed around another 10 years, all right? Because when you shop for everything, what's everything have on it now? Energy Star, the little yellow sticky note that says this is what, how many kilowatt hours or water or whatever this will save you. So, okay. All right. <clears throat> so, as you can see, I don't have a turn up there, but on 14.4, we're basically talking about lines 51, 52, 53, and then a bunch of stuff that falls on 54, okay? 54 is kind of like our other income line 21. It just catches a little bit of everything, okay? All right, retirement savings contribution credit. All right, it is form 8880. All right, yeah, Liz learned that one the hard way today, okay? The retirement savings contribution tax credit is a non-refundable credit available to lower income taxpayers who make contributions to IRA, either a traditional Roth or employer-sponsored retirement plan. This credit is available in addition, in addition to, uh, in addition to any deduction for an IRA contribution. What that means is, when we go to do adjustments to income where you contribute to an IRA, we'll see the other part of this. Um, the 8880 credit, to the uh, retirement, it's it's kind of a perfect storm. You can get up to a thousand. It's a credit for low income that the government is basically saying thank you for funding your own retirement because A, you don't make a lot so you're not gonna get much social security or B, social security is not gonna be there for you, okay? So, you know, it's, it's basically a credit for the government saying hey, thanks for your efforts. The reason it's for low income because the credit can get up to $1,000 or 2,000 married filing joint if they're getting credit of $2,000 from contributing to their retirement, chances are they're probably giving a third of their income to their retirement plan. So, you know, the government's basically saying, hey, you're really, you know, pinching the penny and here's something in return to say thank you, okay? So that's what that credit is, all right? You don't see it a lot because in this day and age, like I said, if you have somebody that makes less than 25,000, A, they're probably not at a job that offers a 401k, and B, you know, they may not be contributing because the $25,000 is paycheck to paycheck and there's no extra right now, okay? So, you know, it's a credit you won't see often, 
but you will see sometimes. And especially, where do you see it, Liz? With A. Where was the one you had today? The four. The four fourteen. Yeah, four fourteen H. Liz had on her return. So. Um, You're saying like under twenty five, probably won't see it. The twenty five line that was AGI was only nineteen. Yeah. But he contributed four hundred dollars at one time. So. Yeah, and what was his credit for it? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty minimal, but you know, it's a credit for them. And you know, for his income, he was doing it because at 414H, that means it's probably a state job, and it almost mandates that they do that. So, did he work for New York State? He works for a store. Okay, yeah, same thing. You know, it's almost something that they mandate that all the employees put into the kitty. So, you know, it probably wasn't his choice. He had to take it. So, all right. But on the flip side, state pensions, whether it be teachers or correctional officers or policemen or anything, those are darn good pensions, those 414s. Because come retirement time, they're tax-free money. I can remember the first time I did one for a, out in Akron for a teacher. that She was a principal in the Buffalo schools, I forget which high school. And she had retired like, a hundred years ago, and her pension was still seventy-five thousand a year, even though she'd been retired for like twenty years. So obviously, they're very good pensions. Principals make a lot of money. Yeah, but they are, that's pretty good pension for have retired twenty years ago. So, yeah. So I was impressed. Made me almost change my career. Okay. All right. So we have those on the the retirement savings contributions. Goes on the form eighty-eight eighty. Uh, where do you see the 8880, Liz? Where's the little box? Yeah, it's on the W-2, okay? So if you have something that qualifies for it, it will either light up on your tree on the left or you check the box on the W-2 to make sure that you get it, okay? Uh, the other one that we'll see is the credit, well, not the credit, but the uh, reduction of income through a contribution to a traditional IRA. And we'll see that when we do adjustments to income. Okay. All right. Child tax credit. Odd that they do this before the uh, adoption credit, but this is a basically a credit that says you get a thousand dollars a year per qualifying child until that child reaches their seventeenth birthday. So the government's saying that you should get a thousand dollars to help raise your child because that's what it's cost to raise your child for a year is a thousand dollars. As far as because they want to basically stick to you when the kids a college seat or when a high school senior because then they're in no man's land because at as as an eighteen year old they may not be in college but they may still be in high school so even when they turn seventeen. They're probably a senior in high school and not in college yet. So you don't get them for the child tax credit, and they're not old enough to be in college or haven't graduated, so you're going to get them for the education credit. So you're sitting there in no man's land. Wouldn't they still be considered a full-time student if they're still in high school? But there's no credit for that because they're, not paying because they're not paying tuition to the high school. Even if it's a private school, it's still, you know, the education credits are post-secondary. So yeah, you're, you're basically stuck with this kid that you're shelling money out for and not getting anything for. So, what's that? Sure, I mean, senior proms, graduations, you know, college applications, you know, tons of things. So, for, for those of us that have been there, done that, so, okay. But yes, the age is different and they lose them in the year that they turn 17, okay? So once they turn 17, even if it's January, or excuse me, December 31st of a year, because they turned 17 in that year, they are not a child tax credit. Okay? So now you're gonna go back and say, why did I hurry up and have that kid on the 31st of December so I could get him as a credit? Now, it's not fair because 364 days of the year, they're 16, but because they turned 17, at the end of the year, they're not child tax credit. So, 
you kind of got it on one end, stuck it to you on the other end, okay? All right, so goes through all the rules about the qualifying child. Again, when you do your tax return, main information sheet, all those things are there. You put the name in, you put the uh, date of birth, so security number, the relationship, how long did they live with us, are they our child, you know, all those things that you answer on the main information in the tax wise, you're basically doing your test to see if that's a qualifying child. Once you answer all those correctly for a qualifying child for the child tax credit, that CTC column in there will light up, okay? So that's where we have to make sure on all those on the test, all right? Okay, and 14-9, there's our light bulb. So basically what I'm saying there is the light comes on, but married filing joint, once our income goes above 110,000, guess what? Light bulb starts to dim and then it slowly goes out and that kid is worth absolutely nothing to you, okay? You love him or her to death, but as far as a tax return, they're worth absolutely nothing to you, okay? All right? That's ammunition for you. When the kid won't do anything at home, you can say, oh, I don't even get tax credit for you anymore. So time for you to earn your keep. All right? Okay. That is the child credit, okay? Bunch of forms on the different calculations. Remember that with the child tax credit, however, that there is a non-refundable and refundable portion. We saw when we did our refundable um, tax return or uh, tax credits that there was a credit that if we did not use all the thousand up above, whatever is left over went down below in the in the form of a refund. Okay, so that thousand, if you only have an eight hundred dollar tax bill and you qualify for the thousand per child, and you have one child. Well, 800 of it eats up the tax bill and then 200 drops down below to be refundable, okay? So it's one of those combination credits. All right, 1416, residential energy credits, okay? All right. Okay. Oops. See, I, this is hard for me. I don't have the dexterity to do this. Okay. On page two, we've been working on our non-refundable credits, okay? So we basically been going right down here. Like I said, we've done 51, we've done 52, we're gonna talk about 53, and then hit 54. We're hitting this section, all right? So, our residential energy credit, 50, oops, come on. Okay, so form 5695, our residential energy credit, okay? These are credits for anything that we do to our home to help it be more energy efficient. Now, the big credits over and above the 500 are solar, solar water, putting a windmill in the yard and really annoying your neighbors. Geothermal, if you got a bunch of spare time on your hand, you want to dig a really deep hole, okay? That's what it is. We had a guy that uh, comes in Lockport, he's a merchant marine, and when he's home, he must have been digging a hole because he did geothermal on his house resulted in about a $15,000 credit on the tax return, but it also cost him about $52,000 to dig the hole. But he's heating his house, and, he's, and he has, no, and he has no, uh, basically no gas or electric heating bill, which, I mean, so he's saving $100 a month or whatever. And I'm going, so 52 minus 12, and then divide that by 100, so it'll take him about 23 years to recoup his cost. That's insane. That's one of the things about some of these solar and, and all these things, all right? It's like when they show those solar panels on TV and the people hold up their $18 utility bill. That's great, but those things cost them about $12,000 to put on the roof, all right? Do you guys hear about the new ones that uh, Tesla and Solar City are doing? 
transparent solar panels. And I guess they could actually, they're strong enough, they could build your roof out of them. I don't know if I'm real keen on that. If I live on this, my bedroom's on the second floor, I don't know if I want a transparent roof. So A, I, I like it dark when I sleep. And B, you know, if the neighbor's got a drone or I'm near the airport, I don't want a transparent roof every morning. Or my neighbors have a third story. You know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it, you know, they're explaining, I'm thinking, oh, that sounds neat. You know, big solar, big uh, skylights, but. So, but solar panels and stuff like that, and two, it depends on how you use them. I have uh, my, uh, one of my professors from UB, they put in solar panels and did the cells to store the energy, and that gets you extra credit. They got about $8,700 credit on their return for the installation. Cost them about 15000 to put these things in, but, you know, they recouped about half of it. Yeah, so it's not bad. So I just hope they live long enough for their utility bills to recoup all the savings. All right, and I guess the thing that bothers me about this, if you think about these, the government's in both sides of the equation because all these solar companies are being subsidized by the government and now, and then the, 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 the taxpayer is getting a credit. So if the government pulls out of this thing on both sides, what's gonna happen? Yeah, it's gonna collapse, okay? All right, so this is the good side, this page one that we have here. Don't see a lot of those, okay? The ones that we see more of are on page two, and this is where that $500 credit, I know Noel was talking about the lifetime portion of it. This is where we have credit that if we do things to our home. Okay, one thing that I forgot to mention because it is on the quiz, all right? You have to answer the questions up above. Was this uh, improvements to your main home in the United States, okay? I'm going to put the address. The other thing that says, were any of these improvements related to the construction of the main home? All right. If you check yes, you really can't claim it because what are you doing? Yeah, it doesn't really count because it's the building of the home, not the improvement of it. Okay. Yeah, but you don't see. And that's not really a spot. You're probably going to want to do that on your business return, either your 1120 or your Partnership return, okay. Now, down below we have all of the portions of the credits. We can see here qualified energy improvements, okay. This means anything that includes labor cost. Insulation materials, did you put new siding on your house? Okay, if you did, did you replace or improve the insulation underneath it, okay. Exterior doors, and I stress exterior doors, okay? Just because you put a new door in the bedroom to keep the heat in so that the kids will freeze and you got or an air conditioner or whatever, that doesn't count, exterior. Metal or asphalt roof, okay? See a lot of people putting these metal roofs on. I have a friend doing it. Did you know that if you do a black roof, you're required to put insulation underneath it? If it's green or red, you don't have to. Apparently the black, absorbs enough heat that it heats the air, the air in the attic and doesn't make it as energy efficient. So you have to put this little piece of insulation underneath the black one, but you don't have to do that on the green or the red. So, all right. But, so, and then asphalt, you know, if you have everybody, and everybody does them now, those architectural grade, you know, that have a 50 year life or whatever on them, so. Okay, um, exterior windows and skylights that meet a or exceed Energy Star. You know, you know, if you guys that are like me, you got that Anderson guy knocking on your door about every other week um, because somebody in the neighborhood's getting new windows and he can't wait to sell you windows. All right. You know, those five hundred dollar windows, probably the ones you can buy at Home Depot and install yourself for one hundred fifty dollars, are just as energy efficient anymore. You know, it used to be there used to be a big difference. So I say that's why these are disappearing. Okay. Get down here. This is where we get into stuff with. Uh, main air circulation fan or my, I lost my uh, residential uh, qualified natural gas for propane oil furnace or hot water boiler, I get $150. And if I put a new blower on it, it's another 50. Okay, for a system that probably cost me what to put in. Yeah. But they're all energy starting. So there's just not any threats. And again, this one always seems like it's on the chopping block every year, but it sticks around. 
So it must be because somebody has constituents that manufacture. Brian Higgins or Schumer probably keep it around for the Tesla plant up here so that people will buy their things that they're creating jobs with, okay? All right, so that's the energy credit, okay? And we'll see some of that in the return. Now, the adoption credit. Obviously, Liz read it, but anybody else read it and say, why am I not adopting kids and making some money rather than going through the headache of having them, okay? Gashay, were you thinking that when you read it? Yeah, thinking, why did I not? Yeah, so. Um, you know, better yet, you could be a foster parent and you can kind of test drive before you adopt and make sure you got a good one. Okay. Yeah, I don't like this one. I'm going to, yeah, can I try another one? So. Yeah, makes fun. Yeah. So. All right. So the adoption credit, great credit. Um, I can't remember if it was two or three years ago. Chris Fabian telling the story about somebody that was just a good hearted woman from the city was a foster and she, you know, foster parent and everyone that came through her house, she got attached to. So she kept adopting and nobody that did her return really realized that she was, could get these adoption credit, you know, and I think he was able to go back, obviously the three years after, you know, before that there's just no statute for it. And it was tens of thousands of dollars for this woman, you know, that she'd left on the table and probably for years prior to that, another 10, you know, tens of thousands. Yes. Now, would they be able to claim the credit if the children weren't with them? If they were, let's say they were only with them for a few months before the tax year is over, will they still be able to get the full credit? Well, it depends. And we'll kind of go through that because with the credit, it depends because you can claim the credit and it doesn't even have to be in the year of the adoption. So, you know, you can do it in the prior year, and then if there's some left over, it can carry forward, too. Because, you know, adoption's not inexpensive, all right? So if you have cost in the previous year, and you're gonna adopt the following year, you can go and use those credits in the previous year while you're shelling out for the lawyer and the adoption agency and stuff like that. So yeah, we'll see, and I'll show you on the form how you, it moves. It's a credit, almost has like a window of eight years for the 13,000. So because you can go back on some and some of it will keep carrying over that you don't use. So, all right, but we'll see that in the form, okay? So the credit this year is up to 13,400, all right? Some employers, it'll show up on the W-2, give you money. They like the fact. I'm sure if you worked for Wendy's, Dave Thomas was adopted himself, I'm sure they got a nice little thing in their benefits package for people that adopt. So sometimes it's just company policies for benefits, okay? And we put that on the form 8839, Qualified Adoption Expenses, okay? On 1421, you see the Qualified Adoption Expenses. Adoption fees, attorney fees, cost courts, court cost courts, court cost, okay? Traveling expenses, meals and lodging, okay? My son, my middle son, will never be married. I swear he never will be. He, he just, he dates a girl and once it starts to become drama, he just gets rid of it. He just doesn't have time for the drama, so. All right, no, no offense to the young ladies in the room, but that's just, that's just not his niche, okay? Um, what's that? Okay. So, but that's his perspective, all right? You're ruining my story, Liz, okay? Anyway, when we, uh, when my oldest son got married, my middle son, you know, we're obviously talking marriage topics, he informed me that he's probably not gonna get married, probably won't have children with anybody that does get married. He's just gonna go to Brazil and adopt himself a little soccer team, okay? <laughs> All right, he's a soccer nut, and he's decided that he'll just go to Brazil and pick him out and just adopt himself a little soccer team, okay? So obviously, he's gonna have some traveling expenses that he can write off, okay? All right, to get to his credit. Um, Readoption expenses of a adoption of a foreign child. What that is, you know, say that he does go to Brazil and adopt his little soccer team, and he adopts them in Brazil. Sometimes the countries don't reciprocate, so he's got to readopt again here. 
Okay, so in order for it to be valid for the United States, so those would be qualified expenses, even though he may have lived in Brazil and already did the adoption, okay? They don't include, uh, you know, funds over and above what you receive is, is from a state or local agency. Sometimes people that are foster parents um, get stipends and may get credit towards the adoption of the child if they do for the foster, okay? That violates state or federal law. All right, we're back to the illicit or illegal activities. If you're paying for your child on the black market illegally, you're not going to get the credit, okay? Are you disappointed, Noel? Okay, all right. Okay, what's that? And I'll wind up. Okay. Um, and then for carrying out a surrogate pairing arrangement. Everybody understands what that is, okay? So if you have somebody else doing the work for you and you don't want to have to deliver the baby, you don't get to take that as a adoption credit, okay? Uh, the adoption of a spouse's child. You know, first time you read that, you're going, what? Well, obviously, if you marry somebody that already has a child, in order to make them yours, you decide to adopt them to make them legally yours, okay? That doesn't count for the adoption credit. I guess it comes as a package deal and you don't get the credit. You get the $1,000 as a consolation prize for the child tax credit, but you don't get the adoption credit, okay? And then as we talked about, anything reimbursed by the employer. All right. So we'll kind of go through that. And when we do the form, all right, Mark went kind of nuts when he wrote on the adoption credit because you're reading all this going, my gosh, it's a great credit, but it looks like a lot of work, okay? So on the adoption credits, if we go to our 1040 page two and this is really hard when you're not facing the right direction. All right, so we have our adoption credit. I'll go through a few more topics here. Obviously, you have to have the name in there, your birth. Why would they ask if born before 1998 and was disabled? Think about a 2015 return in 1998. What's that, what's that up to be? Yeah, all of a sudden we're talking about an adult. Okay, all right. This one's another one that comes into play. A child with special needs, all right? Even if you have expenses that don't allow you the maximum credit, you automatically get it if you're adopting a child with special needs, all right? Special needs is not necessarily just what we think of it where there may be a mental or physical disability, okay? Special needs can be twins. You get one, you get both, okay? That is a special needs adoption according to New York State and Erie County. All right. Children that come from certain ethnic or locations that are hard to place or the state may deem them because they're too old. They're hard to adopt and place. Those so, all. Yes. So even if, because a lot of older children are hard to place, so if there's an adopted 17 year old, they would automatically get the credit? Uh, they would get the full credit. Okay. Because the, the state, because if they've been in the foster system for six years, they may quote unquote consider them a child with special needs because the state and the county really designate that. And like I said, you see it, sometimes you're going, well, that isn't the traditional definition of special needs. Well, sometimes they kind of extend it to hard to place, okay? Uh, a foreign child, child's identifying number. Well, again, we say that because we're not necessarily a social security number, because if we're adopting a foreign child, they might have an ID. So, all right. As we move down here, okay, we have all of our credits here, or excuse me, the calculation of our adoption credit. Once we put it in there, we'll see the maximum credit. Now, one little quirky thing, Karen and I were talking about this the other day, the software used to do this different. When you check that special needs box up above, you have to know down below that you get all 13,400. If you put in for qualified expenses here 5,000 and it's a special needs child, then you're only gonna get a credit worth the 5,000. 
So this is where knowing the law and knowing what the, the adoption certificate says. Yes. Okay, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. How would we know to check the special needs box? Okay, if it's twins, to get one or the other. But how do we know if they're hard to place? You'll see it. They'll come in and they'll know from dealing, well, I take that back. If they have a good caseworker mm -hmm. for the adoption, whatever agency it is, they'll tell them that we've designated this a special needs adoption. And they'll explain to them that then they get the full credit. Because they'll come in with the document, mm -hmm. and right there on the adoption papers, it says special okay. needs adoption. Okay, yeah, so they don't miss it in the system. If they do, then you got a bad uh, caseworker. Okay, all right. So yeah, but you have to know the law in the sense here that you put the, the amount kind of, if you will, override because you have to put 13,400 in, okay? All right, and we have one more credit. For the credit for the elderly or disabled, page 1442. The credit for the elderly or the disabled is a non-refundable credit available to taxpayers who are either age 65 and older at the end of 2015 or retired on permanent disability and have taxable disability income. The credit is limited to tax due. That's where it comes in as a non-refundable. But there's certain tests, okay? Don't see this one a lot, okay? Really don't, because it's again a perfect storm. Because if you think about if somebody's 65 and older and all they have for income is social security disability, do they even need to file? What's that? No, because there's no taxable income. Unless they've had withholding taken out of it and they wanna to try to get it back, okay? But seeing that it's a non-refundable credit, they don't need to file for to get this credit because they're not going to get it because they have no taxable income. Okay. All right. Oh yeah. Yeah, it shows the amount of time that the preparer was in the return. How many minutes? Yeah. For this return last year, it said that it took Maria 1,015 minutes to do this man's return. And he you must have left fired, open for so some reason. He has reason. barely any income. So I went in there and I was laughing and I told her, you know, apparently this took you a very long time. You might want to go help this guy now. Yep. She's like, what are you talking about? So I showed her the time and she's like, no, it must have been left open over the weekend or something because there's no way. So I informed Maria, who's is very, very bright and very gifted at doing returns and stuff. Um, I informed her that next week we'd be doing the retirement class, and it sounds like she needs to come back for a refresher. <laughs> if it's taken her a thousand minutes to do a guy with Social Security and a pension. So she may be in the class next week for a refresher. So, all right. And you can tell her I said that. All right. All right. So, last two ones, we're into the alternative motor vehicle credit and the um, energy battery whatever credit, okay? So we're done with 14. Um, those two credits rank right up there with the uh, unrealized capital gains credit, okay? It, it just doesn't happen, all right? Not even Donald Trump takes advantage of those. Okay, so let's take about five minutes. We'll do chapter seven, and then we'll be all caught up. And capital gains, how many How many red capital gains? Huh? Capital gains is the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Unless, you, unless you read about it. What? What do you mean? It's the easiest thing in the world unless you read it? Because once you read it, then you're thoroughly confused. Yeah. 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 Does your child not like chocolate? Um, well, I have two, and they have more than enough candy. That's just a portion. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My kids always used to get home, and they'd always take pillowcases out. Mm -hmm. And then three of them, they'd all dump it on the floor, 
divide it up by the different things, and then each of them had their favorites, and then they take their favorites. So yeah, they always pulled it. They figured that one out in a hurry that they could get more of their favorites when they did that as opposed to just keeping what they got. My daughter's after my heart. She's a chocoholic, so. Funny, funny, funny. Mm -hmm. Oh, they did. Uh, she make coffee. Good. The jump drive thing. Yeah. Who did you give us? Did she said she gave it to you on Monday. She took it for me via Swiss. Yeah. Okay. And we didn't meet Tuesday, and here's Friday. Yeah, because I, I stuck it in my case. And so she put it on my desk with your name on it. I'm picking it up. I wonder if Chris picked it up off my desk thinking it was Rena's. There's a student in the other class that I substitute teach in every once in a while. She doesn't have the internet, so I have to put the lectures on her thumb drive. So I wonder if she has a blank thumb drive right now. No because I think he picked it up. Okay. So you don't have a thumb drive at all? I don't. What'd you get? Did you get a CD-ROM? I have a CD-ROM. But that's the computer I'm selling. So for now it's useful. When I go to sell it, I'm um, When are you meeting with Esther again? When do you guys get together? Uh, not this Saturday. Is Al usually there? He was there, yes, the last night, but I don't know. This okay. is a random thing for them. They've never done this. Okay. I'll get a hold of Al, because he's not too far away from me to drive and drop it off to him to bring to you. That's okay. Okay. So I can get it out to Al's house. All right. And, uh, and maybe you can pick it up there, because I'll be out that way. Okay. So maybe even some morning when I drop my daughter, because she goes to Clarence High School. So. Well, we're in Williamsville, but we're in the Clarence District, so. We're over by transit behind the Eastern Hills Mall. So we're in the Clarence District. And if you cross the street, we're kind of walking to Lancaster. So go we'll figure that one out. Well, and my place, I just said to both, and my kitchen is Lancaster, and my bedroom is Alden, and then my living room is Clarence. Yeah, that's about right. Put that little thing out there, and uh, Akron's got a place like that, too. The Akron and Lockport kind of almost go like this. Yep. So, all right, capital gains. And you guys reading that, we're probably thoroughly confused, okay? You're thinking that you got to be half of a stockbroker to understand how capital gains works. There's a lot of things in here in the capital gains chapter that really don't pertain. All right? I wish I had my dry erase board, but I'll just use my hands, okay? Basis is always where you start. Okay, we got a basis. This is what I paid for something, all right? I sell it for something greater. The difference is capital gains. Sell it for something less, capital loss, okay? Obviously my goal is to minimize my capital gains. So if I want to adjust my basis, if it's a rental property, or investment property, I put a new roof on. What's that do? Shrinks my capital gain, raises my basis. Okay, but if I take depreciation, I adjust my basis this way. Okay, all right. So that's the way basis works in the capital gains. Start with your basis. 
this draw line, I, you know, like I said, basis in depreciation is one I struggle with because it never makes sense to me. Because every time I think I got it figured out, they change the rules. So I think Esther makes her rules up as she goes along on that one because I think I'm going, okay, I understand now if the person's been dead for two years and they died on a full moon during a harvest, <laughs> then they, you know, it's one of those things and then you're going, okay, I got it. Yes, that's exactly, right. yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden you go, well, hold on a second. But if it was in a life estate and there's, you know, three benefit, you know, then all of a sudden the basis does, the, you know, you're going, oh, okay, that's not fair, you know, so. All I want you to know from this chapter for you guys is basis, draw your line. What'd you pay for, okay? If we don't know the basis, all right, and we sell it for something, the basis is zero, okay? So, in a case of inheriting mom and dad's house when they pass, that they built in 1960 and paid a whopping $2,500 for it, because that was a lot, and you've inherited the house, and now you're going to sell it for 150000 Yeah. So as Noel said, then you got to make sure that you know the basis, because the last thing you want to do is have to go off mom and dad's basis of $2,500. So what you want to do is adjust the basis if you don't know it to your time of possession. And if you don't know it, what that is, then you have what's called fair market value. And a lot of times for a house, all you have to do is go over to the county assessor and they pull out those big leather books that like, look like a spell book out of Harry Potter and open them up and they'll tell you what that house's value was. Okay. Can be. Yes, can be. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but the other thing too is I encourage people because in certain situations, depending on how the house is handled in an estate, make sure that somebody talks to mom and dad before they lose their faculties or, and or you know, start shuffling around the house relocating things, that you know where the papers are because if there isn't something that you need to prove adjustment to your basis and you have no receipts for anything they did to the house through the years, I'm sure that, you know, the contractor that put on the 30 year roof 60 years ago probably isn't still around to go get a receipt from. Okay. So, you know, make sure that you know where those things are. All right. And I'll never forget the one that came in and says, what do I do? Because they had to do something like that. And those thermal receipts were in a garage attic where it got hot. And what's a thermal receipt do when it gets hot? Yeah. Or they just disappear. Yeah. <laughs> the printing on it. It comes in with this box full of things that mom and dad have kept. They did the house and a lot of more thermal receipts. They're all right. Because the heat in the top of the garage had just erased the print. So, all right. So, capital gains. Basis, adjustments to basis, and fair market value. That's all you really got to get out of these terms at the beginning. Okay. The page, let's see here, the basis, again, cost basis, adjusted we talk about, and then basis other than cost, all right? Um, adjusted basis, it talks about on there with the improvements. You know, if we have an investment property and we put a roof on it or something like that that's capital improvements, even our own house, that will adjust the basis if we have to worry about capital gains down the road, okay? So that's why I say keep track of all those things. Page seven, six is a great little chart. 13, that table 13 one says examples of adjustments to basis, obviously capital improvements, all right? Uh, assessments for local improvements. How many have ever fought an appraisal of their house? I can't believe the value of the curb value that uh, putting a sidewalk in and by the city does to your house with the assessor. Well, I, you know, I had one in a house that the city put the sidewalk in. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't even pay for it. I'm sure my tax dollars did, but the value of an increase in my house, and that was their justification. I was like, time out. I didn't ask for the sidewalk. 
What's that? I could care less if people fall. Well, actually, the way the city I lived in works, it wasn't a real great sidewalk. And after one frost heave, I was at more liability for the people tripping on the sidewalk in my front yard that I didn't want put in. And so, all right, so we have that, and, uh, you know, hooking up water, natural gas, things like that. You know, those are increases. Decreases to the basis, you can see on there. Um, you know, big one is, uh, you know, cancellation of debt or casualty or theft loss deductions and insurance reimbursements, okay? If I have a flood and I get an insurance reimbursement, is that going to increase or decrease my basis? Decrease it, because chances are what's happening. My value, that value of that house is not real great now after it's gone through a flood, okay? All right. Okay, so we have all that on there for the basis. All right, so those are the adjustments to the basis. Again, on 7-7, talked a little bit about it. The other thing, too, is uh, 1031s, non-taxable exchanges. What those are, the best way to do it is there's a gentleman out there that we work with. His name is Rich Gallo. He is basically a holding company. So if somebody has a rental property and they want to sell it, they have to recapture what? Depreciation. And they bought it for this. They have it here. They depreciated it. Basically, it does this, okay? What I mean by that is that the government is basically saying for the years that you had that rental property because you were expensing the depreciation to lower your taxable rent income, we were basically letting you use those dollars tax-free. Time to pay the piper. What he does so that you don't have to pay the capital gains, you sell the house into his holding company and it's a 1031 exchange. What that means, a like kind exchange, it goes into this holding company, you sell it, you don't pay capital gains. Another example of that is, I have a rental property in Lockport, New York, and I'm deciding I'm gonna to move to Florida, but I'm gonna buy something that I'm gonna rent when I'm not there to other people. Well, if I take those funds from that sale and do a like kind exchange where I buy something in Florida that is of similar purpose, I don't have to pay the capital gains. Okay, does that make sense for like kind? What's that? Well, you have to rent it. So, and that's where these 1031 lawyer guys come in because they put these things into holding companies and basically it hides the capital gains, okay? Um, we talked about property received as a gift. Does anybody know what the gift tax threshold is? What about married filing joint? It's per, so, so per person. So married filing joint means Yeah, 28000 somebody can give to your household and not have to worry about doing a gift tax return. Now, if, what's that? Yeah, you know, for college and stuff like that. Now, a gift tax return. After 28000 you would have to do a gift tax return, but it's just an exercise in paperwork. Unless that gift is in excess of $3 million, then you might get a little bit of a tax on it. All right? Granted, you probably wouldn't be sitting here with me if you have a relative that's willing to gift you $3 million. What's that? <laughs> so, okay. Uh, inherited property and stuff is on there, okay? All right, and then there's a little help box with the fair market value, okay? Biggest thing with fair market value, what would be the value if it had to change hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller? Don't know why they have to put willing there, but I, as opposed to a coerced buyer and a coerced seller. So they're forced to sell and forced to buy, okay? All right, sale of investment property on page 710. Talked a little bit about that. Um, but we're going to talk about it more when we get into the form, okay? So, the only other thing I want to touch on is page 717, sale of a personal residence. Hello? Not much.
okay? Uh, can I call you back? I'm teaching right now. Yep, okay. Okay. Bye. All right, bye. My junior, my junior in college that's going to adopt a soccer team. So, all right. Um, your personal residence, if you sell it, all right, and you lived it at least two of the last five years, and as a single person, you did not have a basis what you sold it for. The gap is not greater than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Then you don't have to pay capital gains. Married filing joint five hundred thousand. So basically what I'm saying is if I lived in the house for the last two years and I bought a house for 500000 and I sold it for $1.1 million, there's capital gains. I don't know many houses in western New York that this is the case because there's not many houses that will appreciate that fast in two years. And there's not many houses in western New York that are million-dollar homes unless you're hanging with the Pagulas and the whoever else. Okay? So... The other thing is your main home can be a houseboat, a mobile home, a co-op apartment, or a condominium. If you make more than $500,000 on the sale of a houseboat, I want to see the houseboat <laughs> or the mobile home, okay? All right? But that's basically saying that you don't have to do the tax return if you do not get a 1099-S. If your real estate broker throws you under the bus, turns in a 1099S for the sale of your primary residence, then even if it's not taxable, you still have to do a, you still have to report on your tax return. Okay? So that's a shame on that. All right? <clears throat> Will most people get that 1099S? No. 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 The only record that really needs to happen is the HUD one. You know, when you buy and sell a house, you get that. 121 line thing that says seller and borrower and has all these give and takes back and forth. Yeah, that's, yeah. Typically 1099s are not reported um, to the uh, IRS. The 1099, uh, or 1099s are not given, okay? All right. The other thing is, if you are in that class where you own more than one home, okay? So if I own a home in Florida and I own a home in New York, I have to determine which one is my primary residence. All right. So we have to make sure that we realize that uh, we decide which one. The example at the bottom of 718 says seven months and five months. All right. Some people try to get away with six and six. Used to be the IRS were trying to catch those people because they were basically saying, well, I spend six months in Florida, so I don't, but they were still showing themselves as New York residents. Well, the IRS is gonna do a tiebreaker. And sometimes I've heard them boil down to which kitchen has the most dishes, because if you're eating there more often, you must live in New York. Or if you're eating there more often, you must be in Florida, okay? On the top of 719, you can see a bunch of things that they would use as a circumstances test. Obviously, if your address is listed on the Postal Service, voter registration card, the federal and state tax returns, and your driver's license, it's probably where you live, okay? As a side note, my mother found out that she could have voted three times this year. She lives in Iowa, they got to early voting. So she went and did her early voting at a location that was predetermined in the Capitol. She got an absentee ballot in the mail. So just out of curiosity, she walked to the fire hall where she was supposed to vote this coming Tuesday to see if she was on the roster. And they said that she was eligible to vote there. So she could have voted three times. Now, granted, I told her, if you did vote more than once, that is a felony, and I'm not bailing you out. So, what's that? I'm going to let her think about it, because my vote only counted as one, and if it's opposite of hers, I don't want her voting three times to negate my one. So, all right. What's that? So, 
the home is near they, where they work, where they bank, um, residents or families, or religious organizations or recreational clubs. That's where a lot of people used to try to get them over on Florida. Oh, I'm a member at this private country club and play golf in Florida. No, it doesn't work. Okay, your residences, all those other things. Bottom, loss on the sale of personal residence may not be deducted. Does anybody know why that is? Exactly, because they're getting you that get out of jail free card on the game. You think they're going to turn around and let you write a loss off on your primary residence? Okay. The other thing with the last 205, it talks in there a little bit about if it's rental. Um, again, with my mother, we ran into this when my dad passed in Colorado. She moved back to Iowa. They had a residence there. All of a sudden, we were getting to the point where trying to sell it that she had not lived there as her main residence for two of the last five. We were starting to lose our two years. So once that happened, we had capital gains, okay? Because we didn't sell it in the five-year window where she had lived in it for two when it was hers, okay? So again, that's where that comes into play sometimes. So, all right. Okay, so.